Did you know that Jesus of Nazareth was only one of thousands of Jews who were crucified by the Romans? On one occasion, the Romans only stopped crucifying when they ran out of wood for crosses. Have you ever wondered why so much is made of the death of Jesus? When thousands of others were subjected to the same torture and humiliation and pain, or were they? It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today It Is Written presents Why Jesus Didn't Sing. Some people seem able to breeze their way, sing their way through most anything. Others seem not to have that ability. Some people face death with a smile. Others fight it. Now, are some men born to be heroes and others only to be their admirers? Sundar Singh of India, in one of his journeys, was arrested and jailed because of his preaching. But that experience seemed only to fill him with joy, joy that he could endure some hardship for his Lord. And he wrote in his Urdu New Testament, Christ's presence has turned my prison into a blessed heaven. What will it be like to be in heaven itself? He was so happy that he couldn't help singing all night and then preaching from the tiny window in his cell in the day. This infuriated the magistrates. However, guards dragged him into the courtyard and fastened his hands and feet to some rough boards. Then one of the guards opened the prison gate and flung the wooden frame out with sundar on it, right into the heart of the marketplace. Crowds gathered round the half-conscious man, curious to see what would become of him. But soon they were silenced as they began, as he began to sing what they now recognized as a hymn of praise to Jesus. It's not uncommon for the Christian martyrs to sing as they went to their death. We're told that Jerome of Prague, when singing on his way, his countenance lighted up with joy and peace. His gaze was fixed, that is, the historian says, his gaze was fixed upon Christ, and to him death had lost its terrors. When the executioner, about to kindle the pile, stepped behind him, the martyr exclaimed, Come forward boldly, sir. Apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not be here. Then an enemy said of Jerome and of John Huss, who was martyred, martyred shortly before him. He said, both bore themselves with constant mind, and when their last hour approached, they prepared for the fire as if they were going to a marriage feast. They uttered no cry of pain, and when the flames rose, they began to sing hymns, and scarce could the vehemency of the fire stop their singing. So you'd expect Jesus to sing as he approached his terrible ordeal. Wouldn't you? After all, he was divine. His Father would be with him through it all, wouldn't he? Wouldn't Jesus have an advantage over the martyrs in the hour of crisis? Wouldn't it be easier for Jesus to exercise great faith? Jesus and his Father before Bethlehem must have had long discussions about his mission to this earth. Don't you suppose that the Father said something like this to his Son, Bless you, Son. It's going to be tough, I know, but I'll be with you. Angels will be right there. We'll make it as easy for you as we can. And after all, you won't be in that tomb very long. Just a matter of hours. Really, from Friday afternoon to early Sunday morning. Mm -mm. There was no such discussion, no such assurance. Instead, Jesus fully understood that when he entered those final hours, it would be with the sins of all the world upon him. The Father, because of those sins, would have to completely separate himself from his Son. The angels would not be permitted to come to his rescue, and the accumulated guilt of the ages would crush out his life. It was easier for the martyrs. They had no burden of guilt. They knew their sins were forgiven. 
They were at peace with God. They had the promise, the repeated assurance that they would live again. No wonder they could go to their death with a song on their lips. But Jesus didn't sing. Why? Because what Jesus was about to experience might appropriately be described as hell rather than crucifixion. And there will be no singing in hell. You'll understand what I mean before this half hour is over. Judas had gone out into the night to sell his Lord for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Little does he realize that he had sold himself into a slavery from which there was no return. Jesus is alone with the eleven. He longs to share with them the great weight that is pressing on his heart. He longs to strengthen them for the terrible ordeal that will be theirs in just a few hours because, you see, they weren't ready for it. But the experience that will soon be his and theirs is miles beyond anything their minds can conceive. Here they are, so confident in their own strength, their own loyalty. Peter says what all of them feel, that they would never forsake their Lord. After all, they know that he's the Messiah. They thought that any harm, the thought that any harm could come to him or anything shake their faith is simply beyond them. Surely he'll soon take things into his own hands establish the long-awaited kingdom, and everything will be all right. But how tenderly he talks with them, cherishing every moment of this last hour together. How patiently he tries to prepare them for their great trial, telling them again that he'll leave them soon, trying to comfort them with the promise that one day he'll return in the clouds of heaven and take them to be with him. But how could he comfort his men in a grief they did not feel? They leave the upper room now. Jesus leads them out through the eastern gate of the city, a gate which was left open during Passover week. And they came to the brook Kidron. Now, there was no bridge across the Kidron at that time. In the light of the Passover moon, they probably picked their way across by stepping from stone to stone being careful not to stain their garments. Stain their garments? Yes, for it was near the end of Passover week. You see, historians tell us that an almost unbelievable number of animals were sacrificed during that special week. A study was made which estimated that during those seven days, from sunrise to sunset, more than one sheep every minute was sacrificed. The priest caught the blood of these animals in a golden vessel and poured it out at the base of the altar. From the base of the altar, the blood flowed into the great pipes that ran under the temple and out under the wall, and it emptied into the Kidron. So the Kidron, you see, as Jesus and his men crossed it that night, must have flowed red with blood. In fact, we're told that at such a time, the northern end of the Dead Sea was actually tinted red. All this blood? All these sacrifices, sacrifices that were supposed to point forward to the Lamb of God who would come to take away the sin of the world, but their significance in the eyes of both priests and people had been lost. The ceremonies meant to express faith in the one to come had degenerated into meaningless routine, a colossal shame, a colossal sham. Their eyes were on the kingdom. They wanted a king. They didn't want a lamb. And so while all this blood flowed, the true lamb of God, unnoticed and unsung, was picking his way across the Kidron on his way to become the only true sacrifice for sin. As the prophet Isaiah had spoken, he was being led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as he crossed the Kidron and climbed the Mount of Olives, he was carrying the sorrows, bearing our griefs, about to be wounded, bruised, his life crushed out for our sins. And there was none to share that terrible load or even to understand it. As they climbed up the mountain, they came to a fork in the road. If he should turn to the right, they could continue on to the crest of the mountain and descend to the little town of Bethany and safety for the night. If he should turn to the left, they would enter the garden. 
his enemies would find him there. How he must have wished that he could follow on to Bethany. So often he found rest and a large measure of understanding in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. One more decision, but Jesus knew what he would do. The hour had come, his terrible hour, his terrible hour. He would not be turned aside from his mission. He would turn to the left. But now the disciples saw that something strange was happening to their Lord. He was quiet. He was thoughtful. Something could they couldn't understand. And as they approached the garden, his unusual buoyancy, his spirit was gone. No spring in his step. He seemed to be struggling with a terrible weight, began to stumble. More than once they had to support him or he would have fallen to the ground. Once he groaned aloud as the unseen burden crushed his spirit. His men were alarmed. He must be very weary. They must get him to a place of rest. You see, he left eight to watch and wait, and three continued on with him. But even the men closest to him were not to see the agony of this hour. He went on alone to struggle with the powers of darkness and with his own heart. Dear people, please, please try to forget the pictures of Gethsemane that you've seen through the years. Beautiful as they are, they distort the true story. Gethsemane was not like that at all. Jesus did not kneel beside some carefully chosen rock. His robe draped over his shoulders just right, every hair in place as if ready for the camera. No friend. As he entered this secluded spot, he fell prostrate to the ground his face in the dirt. Satan and his demons had come with all of the power they possessed, determined to turn him back from his plan to save men. No light from heaven plays upon the sea. He's entered a darkness such as no man ever experienced. He's taken upon himself this night the sins of the world. Those sins are separating him from his father. So he digs his fingers into the soil as if this would keep the separation from growing wider. Tenaciously he hangs on, weeping uncontrollably as he cries out, Father, if there is any other way we can save men, show it to me now. What was wrong here? Isn't it strange that Jesus should face death with such a terrible dread? The martyrs went singing to their flames. They went singing into the arena with the lions. Is Jesus less courageous, less a hero than his followers? No, a thousand times no. Something is happening here that no martyr has ever experienced. An encounter with lions becomes nothing in comparison. Jesus is moving into his rendezvous with the terrors of hell. Every moment is bringing him closer to a kind of death that no man has ever known. Now, to understand the terrors of hell, to get some grasp of what Jesus was facing, we must move forward for just a moment to a time a thousand years beyond the coming of Christ. It's the day of God's final reckoning with rebellion, the day that will be the end of sin and sinners. It's described briefly in the 20th chapter of Revelation. The earth has been empty for a thousand years, except for the roaming of Satan and his demons. God's people have been with him in heaven. And now with the city of God, they've come back to this planet. The city rests on a giant plain where once the Mount of Olives stood. As we look out upon the surface of the earth, we see it still broken, ravaged, ravaged and desolate. The great cities are in ruins where they fell as Christ returned. But now we see the lost the rejectors of God's grace, called to life from their long sleep, called to life for their final accounting with their Creator. Read all about it in Revelation 20. Satan is exultant, for now he is no longer chained by the emptiness of the earth or the absence of anyone to deceive. He knows that he's but a short time left. He has read the book of Revelation, but foolishly, insanely, he determines to make one last try to rewrite the final pages. He breathes his hatred 
of God once more into the mass of humanity before him. He points them to the city and tells them that with their vast numbers, they're surely able to take it. The order to advance is given with military precision. The great army of the lost moves over the broken surface of the earth and surrounds the city of God. The gates have been closed. But now every eye is drawn upward high above the city. On a foundation of burnished gold is a throne, and Christ is seated on it. The brightness of his presence floods the whole earth with his radiance, and now in the view of every eye, in heaven and earth, the final coronation of Jesus Christ takes place. Those who have jeered him, those who have derided him, those who crucified him now see a mighty angel of lofty stature place the crown on the head of the Son of God. And Satan, watching, knows that the position of that exalted angel might have been his. See? He sees what is, he is lost by his foolish rebellion. As the eye of Jesus turns to the lost, every one is conscious of every sin, every wrong decision he's ever made every rejection of the Savior's appeal. It all appears to him as, he, as if written in letters of fire, panorama before him. And then, above the throne is seen a cross, and in panoramic vision is portrayed in moving sequence what God has done, the incredible length to which he's gone to save man. Not an eye can turn away from that scene described in the Revelation. Every watcher sees in divine replay the scenes of the Savior's life, his birth, his boyhood, his ministry, his hands reached out in healing, his rejection by those he came to save. Every eye sees the mysterious agony in Gethany, Beth Gethsemane, his betrayal to the mob, the fearful events of that night of horror, and finally, before the swaying multitude, the final scenes of his sacrifice are seen again. There's the Prince of Heaven hanging upon the despised cross beams, the jeering mob deriding him, the supernatural darkness, the earthquake, the convulsion, convulsing of the earth at the moment of his death. Every person in that vast throng knows now why he is lost. He knows now that he's lost because he chose to be lost, because he rejected the life that the Savior died to make possible. He sees now that he's exchanged eternity for a moment of passion, a few years of selfish pleasure. Every soul now bows before the Lord Jesus Christ, not in repentance, but in acknowledgment that God is, is just in denying him life. Even Satan bows. Now are fulfilled the words of the Apostle Paul described so potently over here in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Philippians 2, Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Listen, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you ever wondered about those words? Now we see where they fit. But listen, hearts have not changed. Satan has not changed. Rebellion still would banish God from his throne if it could. So Satan makes one final attempt. He tries to stir up the armies of the lost to storm the city. But nowhere in that vast multitude, nowhere in the universe, is there a trace of sympathy for him now. He's exposed before all of the world as the cruel instigator of senseless rebellion, the polluted fountain of every tear that has ever been shed. And then the fire falls. The last book of the Bible again, the fire falls. Revelation 20, verse 9. 
And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from out of heaven and devoured them. That's the only hell the Bible teaches. It's all over. The price for sin has been paid by those who were unwilling to let Jesus pay it for them. And what is the price of sin? Is it, separa- it is separation from God. It is seeing what might have been. It is knowing what heaven is like and knowing that it will never be yours. It is being at the bottom of the wall, outside of the city, when you could have been at the top of the wall, inside. It is knowing that you will never live again. It is eternal death. Do you see now what was happening in the garden? Do you see now what was happening in the garden of Gethsemane? Do you see now why Jesus approached his death with such dread? Do you see why he didn't sing on his way to the cross? Jesus was not choosing to die for us an ordinary death, a temporary death, a death beginning on Friday and ending on Sunday morning. He was paying the price he would have to pay for our sins, and that price is eternal death, death from which there is no resurrection. When he turned to the left that night, when he took the path leading to Gethsemane, When he began to stumble, he was beginning to pay the price that sinners will pay. He was entering into the terrors of hell. He was now bearing our sins, and the Father was separating himself from him. And with the departing of his Father's presence went all hope of a resurrection. True, he had repeatedly said that he would rise in three days. Yes, but that was when he had the conscious consciousness of his father's presence. But in the dense darkness that he was now entering, he would not be able to see through the tomb. He was actually experiencing what sinners at the bottom of the wall would experience as they see themselves forever shut out. Lucifer was whispering to the Savior, you'll never see your father again. You'll be lost forever and ever, and no one will be saved. Even your own men will forsake you. No wonder the heart of Jesus cried out, O my Father, if there is any other way. But there was no other way. And with pale and trembling lips, he formed the words, Thy will be done. He was not deciding to die from Friday till Sunday. He was deciding to die forever, if need be, for you and for me. The price for sin is not a three-day death and then a resurrection. If that were true, we wouldn't need a Savior. We could pay that price ourselves. And the price for sin is not flames. If it were, Jesus didn't pay the price, for Jesus never burned. Have you ever thought of that? Those flames at the end are very real and very literal, but those flames are to put the lost out of their misery, out of their hell. Hell is the mental anguish that has gone before the flames. Jesus entered into hell as he approached that garden that night. That is why he was so reluctant. That is why he felt such dread. That is why he didn't die singing. The price of sin was not the cross or the nails or the thorns on his head. It was not the humiliation or the taunting of those looking on. It was not the physical pain. So great was the pain of separation from his father that the rest of it was hardly felt. It can all be summed up in this. Jesus was willing to die for you and me forever. What can we say in response to such incredible love? What can we do except to love him in return? Would you like to tell him just now that you do and that you understand a little better what it cost him to love you as he does? Shall we pray? Our wonderful Lord, now we understand a little of the cost of our redemption. And that little fills us with wonder and praise. We simply bow in humility and say with Thomas, My Lord 
and my God. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. So just now, may every viewer bathe in the saving provisions of that cross. May the reddest blood the world has ever known wash us and leave us clean in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. I'm Lonnie Melashenko. Our gift for you today is something Pastor Vandeman and I consider very special. It is a reprint of the most moving account of what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane that we have ever read. It is the chapter titled simply Gethsemane from the book The Desire of Ages by Ellen White, a book considered by thousands to be the finest book on the life of Christ ever written. And we'll tell you in a moment how to ask for your copy. Gethsemane. Pastor Vandeman and I have read it many times and we prize it more every time we read it. You will too. Don't fail to ask for it. Just tell us you want the Gethsemane reprint, and we'll know just what to send. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just It Is Written, Box O, that's Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name and we'll put it into the mail right away. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your liberal support, which is so necessary in a television ministry like this. Thank you, Lonnie. And friend, I sincerely believe that it would be good for every one of us if we spent a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. And the booklet that Lonnie has described and offered will help you do just that. But now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.